there's a clash coming. And there's no way we're going to sail around the clash. The confrontation is inevitable. The confrontation that is coming so it's between Christian fundamentalism and Malta. My question is, who creates the violence in the name of religion so that you can finally end the violence in the name of religion? We are living in very, very serious times. They want the church and the state together to regulate conscience. So this is an appeal to the Protestant world. When you look at your roots, don't give up what others were prepared to die for. In the previous lecture, we saw the possibility, and in my opinion, the probability, of a tremendous deception in history of how Roman Catholicism and the Jesuit order managed to disappear underground in terms of its political capacity, and then to resurface later as though nothing had happened in between. But of course, the entire stage for the final conflict on this planet was set during that period. So it was a major, major move and a brilliant strategy on their part. Now, one thing is to set up the infrastructure. But if you want to win against Jesus Christ, if, we, if you want to defeat Jesus Christ, as is their aim, then the only way you can do it with God, because God is invincible, is to cause great pain to him by depriving him of his children. There's nothing that pains the heart of God more than to see a deception which alienates his children from him. It's a very, very subtle and deliberate process. Now the Bible says that in this great conflict that we will have, eventually all of mankind will wander after the beast. But that word wander is written with an O and not with an A. Wonder after the beast implies cognition. In other words, this war is not so much a physical war, which it also is, as it is a battle for the mind. Because it is in the mind where the decision is made whether you belong to Jesus Christ or whether you belong to another force. That's where the battle takes place. In the process, you may die. In the process, you may end up on the stake. In the process, many things can happen. Nations can rise, nations can fall, wars can come. All of these things can happen. But do not fear those who can destroy the body. You must rather fear the one who can destroy the entire Human, human being, body, soul, spirit, in the final conflict or in the final uh, judgment that will take place. And the devil wants mankind to be destroyed. And the only way that he can achieve it is by changing their mindset. So this has always been a battle for the mind. And we learned in the last lecture that the Jesuit order created all the school systems which eventually became the school systems of the entire world. 
and they introduced learning against learning where the two mindsets could clash. On the one hand, you had the Protestant mindset, which said that the Bible is the standard of all righteousness and should be the basis of all schooling. And on the other hand, you had Gnosticism. Man is the center of everything, and man is the one who has to be exalted to the level of deity. So that is emulating the voice of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now, the greatest strategy to win the mind over that the Jesuits used was Jesuit theater, Jesuit drama. Now, if we look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, it tells us Jesuit drama, program of theater, developed for educational and propagandist purposes in the colleges of the Society of Jesus during the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Cultivated as a medium for disseminating Roman Catholic doctrine, drama flourished in the Jesuit schools for more than 200 years. Evolving from modern, modest student exercises to elaborate productions that often rivaled the contemporary public stage in polish and technical skill, the earliest recorded performance of a Jesuit play was in 1551 at the newly founded whatever, in Sicily. In less than 20 years, plays were being performed at more than a dozen of the new Jesuit colleges springing up in cities across the continent, including Rome, Sevilla, Cordoba, Innsbruck, Munich, Vienna, and it grew into a mighty organization. By the mid-17th century, there were 300 Jesuit colleges in Europe, and in almost every one, at least one play was given each year. So originally the plays were pious to attract the people and the Protestants to come and look. But eventually, gradually, other things started creeping in. Uh, originally there were no ladies involved, and eventually more and more ladies, and the music started changing, and it started progressively, slowly infusing the minds of people. Jesuit playwrights also drew upon material from pagan mythology, ancient history, contemporary events, all reinterpreted in terms of Catholic doctrine. So it was very cleverly done. Their stagecraft kept pace with all the newest technological developments. Music was an important element in most of the plays, ranging from simple songs to works that called for large orchestra and chorus. And uh, Mozart, at the age of 11, wrote his first music for Jesuit theater, because his father was one of the directors in Jesuit drama. And this is where the great music world was introduced into this, uh, this way of acting and affecting the mind. Eventually included ballet, opera was brought in, and extravagance and luxury of many of the Jesuit productions came under heavy attack. Many of the productions were enormously expensive, so they spared no cost. And yet it cost them nothing. <laughs> How did they do this? Well, one chariot taken from the enemy, Song Tzu said, is worth 20 of our own. You never use your own money. You always use the money of others. Dramatic performances were prohibited or limited in many areas, and they ceased altogether in 1773. So this period when Jesuits, when the Jesuits were being banned all over Europe, even the Jesuit drama disappeared. It was gone. It appears it ceased altogether in 1773, when the Society of Jesus was temporarily suppressed. So my question is, did it really disappear, or did it just go underground to reappear in another form. So, really? Did it? 
Did it disappear? That's a very good question. Well, let's ask a very modern web page, www.jesuitcp.org, their own web page, Jesuit Arts. It's definitely not gone. Let's go a little back into history. For almost 500 years, they say, theater has played a vital role in the curricula of Jesuit schools. Today, this is them speaking now, in Dallas, Jesuit theater builds on that tradition by offering a broad range of opportunities for students. And they talk about the plays and the absurdist plays and all of these issues. Drama troops they have. This group of seniors performs in local middle schools on a weekly basis as a part of Jesuit community service program. So they take their Jesuit theater into the schools. And Jesuit supports these activities with a broad curricular offering, including theater, art, stage acting, stagecraft, directing for theater. And then they ask you to be part of Jesuit theater. And it seems as though a little college here is doing something and a little college there is doing something. But they are far more brilliant than that. Embedded in Ratio Studorium, rational studies, where the elements of entertainment, dramatic production, composition, rhetoric, eloquence, and these courses interlinked with the spiritual exercises. So here was something to control the mind, Ignatian way of thinking, taking you into a supernatural form of religion, experiential religion, where experience becomes the norm, the feelings dictate. But the mind is bypassed. So they introduced spiritual exercises in the most subtle way to intensify the experience of Catholic doctrine over scripture and Protestantism. This, they resulted in a genre of spectacular plays that won distinction as Jesuit theater. So writes, uh, it's written in Rulers of Evil. Jesuit priest Antonius Kircher then added something to this theater. And uh, what he invented was the megaphone, so that he could speak to greater audiences. And then he invented broadcasting. So he is the father of the modern technology that we see right here in our midst today. Camera theater. And he perfected what was called the magic lantern, Lanterna Magica, the instrument where you could project images on a screen, moving images. So this was the origin of the modern cinema. Now, another interesting uh, point that they had was uh, the invention of cowboy movies, which were the first movies that were ever made. And by the way, the cowboys themselves and the whole cattle industry in North America was introduced by the Jesuits. They introduced it. And the one who did it was a German, Eusebio Kino, whose statue is one of those two representing Arizona in the U.S. Capitol building. He was a Jesuit professor from Ingolstadt College in Bavaria. This is where the entire Illuminist movement started. Now, the name is fascinating in itself because Kino, to this day, is the name for the theater in German. In German you don't say we're going to the theater, we're going to the bioscope, we're going to the kino. Fascinating. And in these cowboy movies, movies there was always a morality. And the morality was always good versus evil, but it was not on the basis of scripture that it was determined what was good or, was, or what was evil, there was another underlying morality, so that man in himself could decide what was right or wrong, and ruling by the gun. The bad guys normally lost in these movies, and the good guys won. And that's how it started. And all the actors were high masons. If you take those early actors, Frank Sinatra, all of those that were involved in those movies, John Wayne, 
they were all 33 degree Freemasons. And if you follow it down through the line to this very day, most of the actors, I would say the great majority, if not all of the major actors, are all high Masons. All the singers, all of them. Now, if you're a major strategist, you don't want anyone to know that you are pulling the strings. So you are always behind the scenes and you will have your front men. And the front men that they introduce, of course, are the Jews. They love using the Jews and term it Zionism. But these are papal court Jews. These are not Jews in the sense as we would understand from the Bible. So knowing and obeying scripture is not necessary in comprehending the ways of good and evil. And this is what the devil said in Eden. You will know good and evil. You don't need God to dictate it for you. Now, after World War II, during September 1957, Pope John XXIII gave Jesuit theater a broader horizon with his encyclical Miranda Prostus. And this is what he wrote. Men must be brought into closer communion with one another. They must become socially minded. Have you heard of social doctrine? Their technical arts, cinema, sound, broadcasting, and television can achieve this aim far more easily than the printed word. The Catholic Church is keenly desirous that these means be converted to the spreading and advancement of everything that can be truly called good. I want to remind you that in the occult world, in the esoteric world, good becomes evil and evil becomes good. So if somebody says something is good, you could in your mind just twist it around and say evil must triumph. Embracing, as she does, the whole of human society within the orbit of her divinely appointed mission, she is directly concerned with the fostering of civilization amongst all people. So here is a move to embrace all of humanity. That means all of humanity must receive the same mindset. John the 23rd urged that pious national films reviewing offices be entrusted to men who are experienced in cinema. At the same time, we urge that the faithful, and particularly those who are militant in the cause of Catholic action, and added there, that must be the Jesuits and their protege, they are the ones, be suitably instructed so that they may appreciate the need for giving these officers their willing, united, and effective support. In 1964, Pope Paul VI amplified this encyclical, Miranda Prozus, with the decree Intermerifica amongst the wonders. And what he said is stunning. He said, quote, It is the church's birthright to use, please note, to use and own the press, the cinema, the radio, television, and others of like nature. That must include the internet. So how much of the media world does it control? Do they want to control? Own and control? All of it. All of it. Then he cited a special responsibility for the proper use of the means of social communication, which rests on journalists, writers, actors, designers, producers, exhibitors, distributors, operators, sellers, critics. So even that which you hear about that which is done by them will be done by them, so the critics will be either on this side or that side of the spectrum, using Hegelian dialectic to so confuse you that you don't know whether you're Arthur or Martha at the end of the day. So it is the church's birthright, not only to own, but to control all media, all social media. The quality of the entertainment content was decreed in a section of Intermerifica encouraging the chronicling, the description, the representation of moral evil, which can, with the help of the means of social communication and with suitable dramatization, lead to a deeper knowledge and analysis of man and to manifestation of the true and the good in all their splendor. Here's the battle for the mind, good and evil. Now, 
What good and evil? Biblical, based, good and evil? Or worldly based, good and evil? Esoteric, good and evil? Well, let's continue. Emboldened by this papal decree, social communicators have been talking about free speech and all of the issues that are involved. Now, if we take cognizance of the fact that there are two, own, control, all the media, and to use it to instill mindsets in people, then I would like to know how this is achieved without anyone knowing how it's done. Isn't that what the general Sun Tzu said? We have to achieve things without anyone knowing how it's done. And we must never ever be the target. It's always good to use the enemy to do the work for you. And even if you represent the enemy, you will pretend that you are not the enemy, that someone else is the enemy, so that it's never you. There's always a front. Now we're going to look at some of these uh, productions and see if we can see a pattern. The Simpsons and philosophy, the door of Homer, etc. If you read a little bit about it, it says it's a non-fiction book analyzing the philosopher and popular culture effects on the American animated sitcom. Now, people think, you know, this stuff is silly. Who, who cares about all of these idiotic cartoon characters. Millions of people are sitting and watching. Millions. These playwrights that write these episodes receive millions of dollars in salary. And if you want to know what type of people are involved in writing these scripts, you will be stunned because they are the most educated people on the planet. Harvard graduates with PhDs in philosophy and mathematics. And they use occult numerology in order to achieve what they want to achieve. So now let's have a look at some of these. And if you look at it, you'll think it was sort of innocuous. The 33rd episode of the show aired in season two was titled The War of the Simpsons. The episode features a plot that gives tribute to Ernest Hemingway's Old Man of the Sea and features a battle for the ages between Homer Simpson and General Sherman. Let us quickly examine the numerology of Sherman. And if you look at this numerology, you will find that Simpson adds up to, if you take the numeric value of the letters, to 33. Now, if you look at that, you might get confused because there are many forms of numerology up there. And uh, looking at this, you wonder, how does this add up to 33? Since when is S the value of S1? Because normally in the alphabet, you take the value of where the letter is in the al alphabet. So A would be 1, B would be 2, C would be 3, etc. So why does this add up to 33? The same with, with Sherman. Why does that add up to 33? And here you have a 33, and it was the 33rd episode. Now, I'm just showing you this to show you that there, there is numerology involved. Now, numerology is a Gnostic, pagan, uh, Kabbalistic, if you like, art. Everything that the Kabbalist will do is steeped in numerology. Everything has numbers. Everything moves in precise cycles. They will not make a move until the situation is right, till the solstice is in the right place, till the right liturgy has appeared. Everything is governed by numerology. There is a ethos of power in numerology. Now, the numbering system that they are using here is not the normal numbering system, but the Pythagorean numbering system. And if you take Pythagorean numerology, then S indeed becomes 1, and I indeed becomes 9 and 4 and 7, etc., etc., etc. 
So it's a highly sophisticated mathematical formula that they're using, and the names have very specific meanings. Now, you don't know that as you're watching it. You're just watching a silly movie. But put into these, there are subliminals to affect your mind. And they plant ideas which your subconscious picks up. And eventually, everybody starts thinking along those lines. Now, this is a cartoon. It's an adult cartoon. Kids also watch it. But if you then add the press and the news media, and you can switch channels. I mean, you can go from CNN to BBC to Al Jazeera to whatever channel you want. You get exactly the same news at exactly the same time, repeated over and over again. There must be some coordination between those groups, otherwise they all wouldn't have exactly the same thing. Don't you think so? And there's a propaganda so that you believe what they say. So if you want to create an enemy, a public enemy, what's the best way to do it? To create an enemy and then to broadcast him across the media. So there is numerology involved, there is occultism involved, Kabbalistic occultism, and we'll go a little further. Here's a, a little further snippet. They introduce little subliminals all the time. So, in this story, this character is often punished and has to go and write on the board his lines, and he says, I will not plant subliminal messages, but if you analyze it, really, it, it says subliminal mesagores. It doesn't say messages, he's misspelling something. But there's a sal subliminal there, Al Gore. So they're telling you that the agenda of Al Gore will become prominent in world affairs. And the Pope has just brought out an encyclical on this very subject, which is supported by the Al Gore philosophy. And the President of the United States of America said, this is what we have to do. So these people know in advance what they will do, how they will do it. HDTV is worth every cent. HDTV is worth every cent. That means anybody watching it, any little kid with half a brain that can start reading, will know that he needs the best quality TV so that he can be indoctrinated in the best possible fashion with the latest light effects and everything that you need in order to affect the mind bypassing the cognitive functions of the brain. Interesting. New York, 9-11. And if you take Michael Jackson, May 20, 1997, there he is dancing away at the destruction of New York with the massive cloud going up behind him. All done way before the event actually took place. Now, this is interesting stuff. So not only 9-11, by the way, that was a 1997 episode, and the event only occurred in 2001. So are there any other subliminals? Well, of course. Here you'll have the all-seeing eye, and they will use only half the face to project that image. And when they're unpacking their toys, you have all the occult symbols present in these subliminals. Now these, remember, are not airy-fairy people writing these. These are Harvard graduates with PhDs in philosophy and mathematics, and they have exceedingly great depth of knowledge of occultism because it's in all their subliminals. The Pledge of Allegiance does not end with Hail Satan. He has to write this over and over and over again. Now, just the expressions on the faces, you can see how it can affect little children, because what they see is what they do and what they live. Let's let, have a look at some of the introduction of these ideas and how it all began. Uh, in the early movies, Sammy Javis Jr. used to play a very important part. He also acted with all these 33 other Freemasons 
that were uh, the early cowboy movie people. And he, of course, was known as a member of the Church of Satan. Apparently he switched, but it's fascinating that he also was a Knight of Malta. And here he is seen discussing very important issues, I believe, with uh, producer of We Are the World, he was Lionel Richie, and he's discussing issues here with Donald Monin, SJ, Society of Jesus, president of Jesuit Boston College. And this, of course, became then the new musical production that was absolutely broadcast over the entire world. Because humanity has to unite in one mindset. And so let's create chaos, let's create false flags, let's create enemies so that we can herd humanity into one camp and let's have a rainbow nation and all the colors of the rainbow represented. I'm a red Indian, I'm a Chinese person, I'm a that and I'm a this and we are the world, we are the people. And what is the spirit behind it, I ask myself, in this process. Now, if we continue in this modern Hollywood era, let me remind you again, it is the church's birthright to own and control all media productions. So who really controls Hollywood? It's not the Jews. There's another power that controls this entity. So we'll introduce extraterrestrialism, it becomes very prominent, and then we'll link it to messianic messages as we condition minds as to what will happen, close encounters of a third kind, let's bring in uh, things which can be, well, determined either extraterrestrial or demonic intervention. And all of the great megastars, well, they don't hide where their affiliations are, as you can see. Simon Cowell's little jet ski with his nice little Masonic symbol right on the front. They're not scared. And today, everything is out in the open. If you are interested, you can go to the web and you can punch in any actor, any actor, that is prominent in the world today, any singer, any group, and look at the occult connections, their Masonic connections. I had a young girl who got tickled pink and started doing this. She drove me crazy with the thousands of, of things she sent me, but uh, she did a great job. Every single one is involved, and they all blatantly confess to their affiliations on their Facebook pages and on their this and on their that. I don't have time to look into all of that stuff. But if you're interested, you can verify it. I don't have to give you the details. That's not what I'm here about. I'm wanting to discuss the mindset and what happens behind the scenes. Now, I want to discuss one or two or three or four of the mega blockbusters. This one was not too much of a, of a success with Nicolas Cage in theatres, Season of the Witch, in which uh, there's a medieval night situation and this conflict between Islam and uh, the Crusades and desertion, and then there is uh, a witch who is possessed. But the way they deal with it, with, with all the blood and the gore and the drama to, to distract your mind, you always end up somewhere in a Catholic conclave. There's always a monastery where there is secret information and hidden knowledge, which eventually, even if all the monks are slaughtered in the process, the hidden knowledge will be able to be used and exercise this demon power. The power lies always in the church, and it's always available to you through the church. You've probably noticed that every single Hollywood movie has a Catholic priest. You never see a Protestant one. National treasure, already it tells you right there on the cover uh, the, uh, what their intention is with the all-seeing eye. And this one is so full of masonry, nobody should watch this stuff, but I'm just telling you that 
this is how children and people are being indoctrinated into a way of thinking. When you come to the movie The Exodus, Gods and Kings, it is probably one of the most godless movies ever made. And I don't have to discuss it with you. You can even watch it on this very channel where there's a discussion about this movie and how the directors feel. They are enemies of God. They hate God. They call Moses the most arrogant person that ever lived when the Bible says he was the most humble person that ever lived. They don't believe in God. They distort God. They twist the word of God. They ridicule God in every possible way. So they cannot be from God. They must be from the other camp. Then this massive production, The Kingdom of Heaven, spectacular epic and adventure. The main message of the movie is a post-enlightenment opposition to violence carried out in the name of religion. Now there's a very powerful message. My question is, who creates the violence in the name of religion so that you can finally end the violence in the name of religion? Is it a master strategist sitting somewhere behind the scenes pulling the strings? Making enemies appear as enemies when actually there are no enemies. Being in the field beforehand, using chariots of others as your own. Interesting. Again, if you want to find the Jesuit connection, you have to search a bit. You have to dig a little bit, but it's always there. It's somewhere in the wood pile. You just have to search around said Father Leo Lefebvre, the theology professor of Jesuit-run former Fordham University. Uh, he said, you know, this is what the movie is about. The Times then tries to reassert the film's group hug, whatever status, with a quick quote from a cooperative priest who says exactly what they want to hear. The Reverend George Dennis, a Jesuit priest and a history professor, at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, who was one of the five experts provided with a script for Kingdom of Heaven, said he was impressed with the nuance and accuracy. The Christians are always the bad guys, the others are always the good guys. This is a mindset without the backdrop of history that is being instilled in, man, in, in humanity. Historically, I found it pretty accurate. Well, if you have a distorted mind, I don't know whether you know, but you cannot find the history of the Reformation in any meaningful way in any modern document dealing with that subject. You have to dig for the old moldy ones. When you open them, they have this moldy smell and this damp, acrid feel. Then you know you've got gold in your hand. Because the Jesuits have rewritten everything. They own the press. They own the press. So you rewrite history, as we will see. Not so fast, you, George, etc. So they're arguing about it. But the fact of the matter is what I'm showing you. The ones supporting it from behind are who? Jesuits. Jesuits. The Count of Monte Cristo. Probably one of the most brilliant allegorical movies, and the Count of Monte Cristo, who suffers greatly and eventually becomes mega rich, but he doesn't get the girl. Who is he? Well, he's none other than the Jesuit general himself, about the story of the Jesuits and the demise of the Jesuits and the resurrection of the Jesuits, immensely wealthy, that he can purchase the whole world, if you like. So these are stories that are implanted, and the hero is always, in the end, the evil triumphing over good, made to appear as good triumphing over evil. Brilliant strategy. Take any of the Indiana Jones movies, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and all of these issues, the language that is used, is demeaning to God. Although it uses the themes of the Bible, 
eventually it leads you straight into hardcore occultism, Gnostic thinking. Now, if you've prepared the mind, you come up with movies like Left Behind, and they spent billions. They don't mind spending billions. How much do these productions cost? And already in the Middle Ages, they were criticized for the vast sums. They feel nothing for spending millions upon millions, if not billions of dollars, on a production if the ends justify the means. And the Left Behind series, of course, implanted the Jesuit theology of dispensationalism, which comes straight out of the Jesuit camp, with Cardinal Bellarmine adding his uh, thinking patterns to those of, of Alcaza and Ribera that went before to set the stage for getting rid of the mindset of the Protestant world that the papacy was Antichrist, and replaced it with this airy-fairy nonsense, which is then propagated across the world in mega productions. They don't care whether it's a box office success or a box office failure, as long as the message comes through. Lords of War. All of these are phenomenal. Now, I thought I'd take one, where I've heard so many of our own people even saying, well, this is one one should watch because it really shows us where we are. And uh, I know that many have exposed it for what it is, and that's good, but let's just make sure again that we're not speculating here over, over issues that might not be so. Mel Gibson and the Passion of the Christ. This is probably the one movie that moved the evangelical world to tears like no other movie prior to it. And I want to just go through a few scenes, but let's just establish again the connection. Mel Gibson receiving his honorary doctorate at Loyola Jesuit Marymount University. He must have received his honorary doctorate for something good. Do you know what? This doesn't pay because his life was a misery after he made this. But uh, irrespective of what his future plans are, uh, which I've heard about, the fact of the matter is this is a Jesuit production and it has Jesuit theology. But before we go there, let's just have a look at the prophecy in Zechariah so we can understand the context. Zechariah 11, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Who's it talking about? It's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Then I cut in cut in two my other staff, bonds, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord said to me, Next take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. The good shepherd, they sold him out. The good shepherd, they set him aside. They crucified him. So if you want to set aside and reject the good shepherd, well then be satisfied with a foolish shepherd. Now let's look at the foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off. He won't care for them. Nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that stand still. This is not a good shepherd. This is an evil shepherd. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. So he will be a destructive shepherd. He will destroy mankind. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Right. Those are the criteria in the prophecy of Zechariah. And these are the criteria which apply to the good shepherd or the bad shepherd? Bad shepherd. The evil one. Now remember in the occult world, good becomes evil and evil becomes good. So now let's go to the movie. 
in most of the movie, Jesus appears with his right eye completely shut, smashed. There's the symbol of the eye. There's only one eye. If you take the Council of Foreign Relations, their Messiah, who is naked, and by the way, in this movie, Jesus appears out of the grave, naked. I'm sure he didn't. He appeared with a robe of righteousness. He was not naked. This Messiah of theirs is naked and only shows the left eye. The right eye is never seen in their Messiah. So here, Jesus' arm is dislocated, so says this webpage, in order to make his hand reach the nail hole, meaning that his arm should be fully extended and straight at all times. However, in almost all shots of him on the cross, his body sags forward with his arms bent at almost 90 degree angle. So his arm is withered and his right eye is smashed. Now let's just make sure again. Let's go to the occult world, Blavatsky. The devil is now called darkness by the church, whereas in the Bible, he's called the Son of God. The bright star of the early morning, Lucifer, there's a whole philosophy of the dogmatic craft in the reason why the first archangel who sprang from the depth of chaos was called Lux, the luminous son of the morning. Or man, Vantaric Dawn, he was transformed by the church into Lucifer or Satan because he is higher and older than Jehovah and had to be sacrificed to the new dogma. Now in the esoteric world, Satan is higher and older than the other brother, who is Jesus. And the war between, of, between the two of them is raging. And he, the older brother, was deprived of his position, but will regain it. He will be the victor. So good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Of course, we know that he is a created being because the Bible tells us so, but not in the esoteric world. Or another quote here from Blavatsky. Esoterically, he is also the serpent or the dragon that tempted Eve, and the dragon is an old glyph for astral light, which is the wisdom of chaos. So Jehovah is the serpent. He's the bad one. God is evil. So evil becomes good, and Good becomes evil. Now, let's continue. In the movie, while on the cross, Satan with an effeminate image walks by and he has the birth of the other Messiah. I want you to look at this child because you can see his hairy arms and his baldness and his... Uh, Demeanor, and we're going to just quickly play this. I want you to look at the smile on this evil face. As he looks at the cross. They cannot have, look at the hairs on his back. They cannot have created a more evil image than this. And it's virtually subliminal because nobody really notices it in the movie. And look at that evil smile. Now, good becomes evil and evil becomes good. So the evil is hanging where? On the cross. But the real evil is actually the good because you have to turn it, everything around in the esoteric world. This is actually a symbol of the victory of Satan over Jesus Christ. This is what it means. Now, let's just make sure. Now, Gibson told Christianity Today, I've been actually amazed at the way I would say the evangelical audience has, hands down, responded to this film more than any other Christian group. What makes it so amazing, he says, that the film is so Marian. Gibson calls it the tremendous co-redemptrix and mediatrix. So the whole movie is about Mary. Mary is the one who consoles everyone. Mary is the great hero of this movie, not Jesus Christ. 
Now another final little interesting little tidbit about this movie. The penitent thief on the cross was wearing around his neck the Catholic brown scapula. There. So if you look at the shot of him, he's wearing a scapula. Now in the Bible do you read that he wears a scapula? Now what is the scapula? Uh, the scapula is a structure that you wear around which guarantees you that Mary will let you bypass purgatory and take you straight to heaven. So it is a promise to Mary, not to, to God. So Jesus could not have given her, him the right to go to heaven one day. It's Mary that will decide who goes and who does not. But Mary, as we know, is an acronym for Lucifer because she was immaculate without having to need the atonement. And then that Jesus said, it is accomplished rather than it is finished. According to Rome, it was the Eucharist which was accomplished at the cross. Now, this word accomplished is rather interesting. The Eucharist, the sacrament of our salvation, accomplished by Christ on the cross, is also a sacrifice of praise in thanksgiving for the work of creation, says the Catholic Catechism of the, of the Catholic Church. So it was accomplished, almost consummated. And it is, of course, the perpetual sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the constant treading underground of the Son of God keeping in perpetual death, worshipped as a corpse. This movie is evil, and you can see the underlying evil in the subliminals. It is Gnosticism at its worst, dished up and sold to Christians as the representation of the suffering of the Son of God. It is an evil movie. John 19, verse 30 says, Jesus therefore, when he had taken vinegar, said, It is consummated, and bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. So says the Douay Rhymes Bible, which is the official Jesuit Bible. Whereas, a decent Bible will say, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, Thayer's definition is to bring to a close, to finish. The sacrifice is complete. It's not complete in this movie. Now, another in interesting movie with uh, Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts is Conspiracy Theory. Now, there are people who love to talk about conspiracists. And there are many conspiracists out there who are incredibly confused. But if you have the filter of the Bible and pro prophecy, and you put everything through that filter, and what comes out at the other end harmonizes not only with history and current events, but with prophecy as well, it's not conspiracy, it's confederacy. And the Bible says, call it not a confederacy, a confederacy. So, I'm a confederist, I'm not a conspiracist. But in this movie, it's very interesting because he is subject to MK mind control, monarch mind control. And the whole issue is blatantly shown you how it is done. And in actual fact, this is what happens in the world. You can program anything, anyone to do anything. So you can create the mega criminals and the murderers. When we were young, Little children in school. There was no such thing as someone going psychologically berserk and blasting away everybody in the school. But now, it happens on such a regular basis. Have the kids changed? No. Something happening behind the scene. So all of these stars are all involved. Now, one of the things that is interesting about this movie, and it's only subliminal, it's only a flash. This book, constantly appears in the movie. So Mel Gibson is, is in his mind-controlled state trying to get something, and he's trying to get copies of this book, and it's always disappearing, and he opens a shelf, and it'll flash for a millisecond and be gone. And you have to look very carefully. I don't suggest any of you look. It's called The Catcher of the Rye. So 
I want to know what's the capture of the eye all about. Must be important. And who would suggest that something be in a movie of this nature? So I did some searching and some searching, and it's very hard to find. Until I found something interesting, I found an interesting book, The Secrets of Jesuit Soup Making. <laughs> written, of course, by Jesuit brother Rick Curry. There's his title, S.J., Society of Jesus. And it is indeed a recipe book. But every book written by a Jesuit always has a what? Has a purpose. And it always is the mindset of the society as a whole regarding its oath and subject to the Jesuit general himself. So, of course, it is interlaced with all the Jesuit philosophy. And he's telling about his student days and how he was in a curriculum, etc., I was reflecting the other day on a Jesuit teacher of mine at St. Joseph, etc., and he talks about the curriculum, and he says here, the interesting thing is, the curriculum at St. Joseph was in the old style, the ratio studorium, rational thinking. In other words, rationalism and not Bible-based thinking. The Jesuit plan of studies first published in 1519, Nine, that was found in all the Jesuit high schools of the United States at that time, etc., etc., etc. So you're getting, you're getting the picture. And then he says over here that he had an enormous impact on me, this teacher he had, this Jesuit, became a Jesuit himself. In English class, he had us read The Catcher in the Rye. Aha! Huh. So the Jesuits make you read that book, and there it is subliminally in this movie everywhere. I don't remember much about the model from novel from that first reading when I was a freshman, but I do remember that this Jesuit father said, this was the kind of novel you should read again and again in your lifetime. So I was interested, what is this all about? It's about rebellion. And it's brilliantly written. It is the normal development of a youth, and this youth develops the capacity or, or the rebellion that comes up, and how to exercise this rebellion, and eventually to change the world through rebellion. But in such a brilliant way that the one who is rebellious against everything, his parents and society and you name it, turns out to be the greatest saint of them all. Who was the greatest rebel in heaven? And doesn't he want to appear as the greatest sin, saint, the wronged one? So it's implanting a mindset, a mindset of dissent against the order. What order was the Jesuit order created to destroy? Protestantism. So you have to rebel against Protestantism. One of the most evil movies in the history of Jesuitism is probably V for Vendetta. Now in this movie, they have this masked man, because he was injured, severely injured in a fire, so he went through the fires of affliction. It is a skit of the Jesuits and the gunpowder plot, where they wanted to blow up the British Parliament and King James. Now, again, whether it's a false flag and it's a double false flag or a triple false flag, let's not go into it, but British Parliament was that bastion of Protestantism that had banned Jesuitism and the mindset of Jesuitism and was the protecting factor of Protestantism. So it was the ultimate enemy. It had to be destroyed. And Guy Fawkes and six Jesuits wanted to blow up the British Parliament and the King, thus ridding the world of the menace of Protestantism. Now, the mask is the face of Guy Fawkes, who was sentenced to death and martyred. But in the movie, constantly, you are reminded that this story may never be forgotten. This man was not a villain, this man is a hero. Uh, just in history alone, they've managed to do that because every year on exactly the same t date when he tried to blow it up, they celebrate Guy Fawkes 
And it's a joyous occasion. Kids can't wait for Guy Fox. You positivize that which is negative and you use the negative in, to your advantage. They even got Shakespeare to write it, which I doubt. His Jesuit superior wrote it for him. His Gnostic uh, Medici learned supervisor and filtered it in amongst the people as this evil of the Jesuits and made a joke of it. And eventually, as a consequence, the Jesuits were actually allowed to operate, or the Catholics at least, in England again. You always have to be a super strategist. Now, in this movie, this young lady eventually is the one that pulls the trigger because he dies just beforehand, so she becomes an acronym of Mary, which is Lucifer, who will destroy Protestantism, and where they first failed in their early attempts, they will succeed in their later life. And uh, this is one of the advertisements. He's making the Masonic crossed swords, which you will find everywhere in, in Masonry and in Gnostic, Gnostic Freemasonry. An X is an ancient symbol, according to Jim Tresnor, 33 degrees, Scottish Rite Journal. An X is an ancient symbol for change or transformation. Long associated in medieval and Renaissance art with the coming of the Messiah who shall make all things new. So this is a religious movie showing the victory of Satan and the Jesuit order over Protestantism, the overthrow. That's why in the cathedrals they always have Loyola standing on the head of Martin Luther, crushing him, destroying the Bible. They make no bones about who the enemy is. And it's interesting that in this movie, eventually, this is an artist's rendition, the parliament and, of course, uh, all of the buildings associated with it blows up and is completely destroyed. Nothing left. But the clock stands where? It is the final hour. It is finished. They have succeeded. The job is done. Protestantism and Bible-based theology will disappear. And eventually this masked man who stands for Guy Fawkes and the effort to overthrow Protestantism, the mask is worn by the entire nation. What does that mean? It means that the entire nation, through time, has been indoctrinated to have the same character and mold and thinking as they had. When the Bible tells us about the face of God, Moses was not to see the face of God. He conceived me from behind, because nobody can see the face of God and live. So I'll hide you in the cleft of your rock and I'll cover you with my hand. And I will go by and then the character of God is, is given in the most beautiful poetic form. The face stands for the character. It stands for the mind. It stands for the thinking. The world will wander after the beast. It will be indoctrinated to have the mindset that he wants you to have. Now I want to know where this is going to lead. And how do you carry on with this? I just want to do a few more uh, pointers here. The list of actors employed by these papal criminals, so says Vatican assassins. This man, of course, has, has a mouth that is um, very loose, if I may say, so excuse his language. But what he says in a rather harsh way is actually correct. The list of actors employed by these papal criminals is most impressive. Hollywood is merely Jesuit theatre, nothing more. Jews involved are papal court Jews worshipping their god mammon, etc. And it's for the military company of Jesus. Now, if you write something in that fashion and you write it so harshly, maybe people were saying, ah, that suits them too, they don't mind. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are authors of some of these thoughts. Now, Knight of Malta, Jack Valenti, was head of uh, Motion Picture Association of America. If you want to know who controls the, Mary, the mega studios, in 2004, Mr. Saxon was inducted as a Knight of Malta. He owns uh, 
owned all of these major companies and, well, also Hollywood studios. Is it really the Jews who control this place? There's an abundance of a theatrical performances we read in a good source now. You see, that's the one mindset. Let's achieve our aims through theatre, through great performances that bypass the cognitive. Now let's see what God's way would be, in the spirit of prophecy. There's an abundance of theatrical performances in our world, but in its highest order, it is without God. That's a fascinating statement. We need to now point the soul to the uplifted Savior. Deceptions, impositions, and every evil work are in the world. Satan, the wily foe and angel's garments, is working to deceive and destroy. The object of the death of Christ was to declare his righteousness, and no man, woman, or child can do this in their own strength or by their own words. So here's a false righteousness portrayed in these movies. Here's another quote from Adventist Home. Through the drama, he has worked for ages to excite passion and glorify vice. The opera, with its fascinating display and bewildering music, the masquerade, the dance, the card table, Satan employs to break down the barriers of principle and open the door to sensual indulgence. So there's two ways of reaching minds, one through the theatrical and one through the word. Shows and theatres. Satan's ruling passion is to pervert the intellect and to cause men to long for shows and theatrical performances. The experience and character of all who engage in this work will be in accordance with the food given the mind. The Lord has given evidence of his love to the world. There was no falsity, no acting in what he did. This is interesting. So we have two contrasting mindsets. Which one do you think will be the more popular in this world? Well, hands down. Now, let's get a little bit closer to very modern little children's stories and others and find out what the real message is and how the mind must be indoctrinated and then eventually, where will it lead to? Because this is what I'm very passionate about. Now in ancient Greece, the god Apollo and Artemis, or Pan and Diana in the, in the other nomenclature, were very, very prominent deities. Even mentioned in the Bible is Diana of the Ephesians. And she's of course the goddess of fertility and uh, she's also the consort of the god Pan. Now Pan has two sides to him. He has the goat side, the evil side, where he plays the pan flute and he's the god of sexuality. He roars through the forest, causing panic. That's where the word panic comes from. Pan, chaos, he rapes, he pillages, he's violent. And then he has a good side, which is the good shepherd side, where he carries the, the sheep and he is the good shepherd. And uh, this is a very fascinating interplay of good and evil because Satan has a yin-yang philosophy. Everybody has both sides of the coin. Whereas God says, no, you don't have to be evil. You can be only good. You don't have to be balanced by evil in order to make good prominent. So here is the god Pan in his evil form with his Pan flute. But he doesn't always have to be shown with his horns and his goat form. Now if we go to animated movies, like you will find in Disney's Peter Pan, then uh, who are the, the writers and the organizations? We all know that uh, Walt Disney was a 33 degree Freemason, he was steeped in Medici learning, the Jesuits were behind him, obviously, because they are the harborers of Medici learning. They are the ones who control it in the world. They are the experts in the occult art and in Gnosticism and Kabbalism. Now in this movie there are a number of interesting characters. Peter Pan, Wendy, John and Michael Darling and the mother, 
who is of course called Mary. It's obvious. And who is Peter Pan and who is Wendy? Well, if Peter Pan, it's an interesting Kabbalistic name as well, because Pan, the god of evil, has a consort who is Diana, but he also has a representative on this earth who is called Peter, uh, if you get my drift. And in that theology, there is a female entity who is the mediator and the mediatrix, and that is Mary. So if you analyze the names, you have Peter Pan, you have Wendy, and you have John, and you have Michael. Now the name John, always in the occult world, becomes an acronym. An acronym for something else. We'll discuss this a little bit. Just to show you a little bit more of another side of Peter Pan, he always wears this little hat with a feather in it. Now, it's actually a replica, and well, we don't have to go into all the details. Just remember, Peter Pan has that little hat on his head, and he has funny ears, and obviously he's alien, he's not from, from this dimension. And there are the three little children, John, Wendy, and Michael. Now, let's have a look at the personalities. This you can find on any web page. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to find this. John is shown to be extremely sophisticated, despite his age. He often speaks in a sophisticated way, which his younger brother, Michael, usually mimics and repeats, although simplistically, in a stupid way, in other words. For example, John, oh, I should like very much to cross swords with some real buccaneers. Michael, yeah, and fight pirates too. Obviously, it's one and the same thing. The one is just sophisticated, the other one is not sophisticated. Now, let me take you to heaven. In occult thinking, who's the older brother in heaven? Satan. Who's the younger stupid brother in heaven? Jesus. What's his other name? Michael. Okay. Now it's also interesting that uh, this younger brother shows interest in piracy, which may explain why he plays the part of Captain Hook. Now is Captain Hook the good guy or the bad guy? He's the bad guy. He's the evil one. And Michael always plays the part of the evil one and they cross swords, and they're fighting. Now, these are the swords with which they fight, and it's all made to appear very congenial and interesting and funny, and kids love it, and adults love it too. But can you see that the sword can also double for a cross? So this is a battle for your soul. Now, how far will this eventually go, and what do the acronyms actually mean? Now, let's just make sure. I've shown this in an old one of mine, but I'll dig it up again for the purpose of this lecture. There is a uh, famous monastery, cathedral in Europe, where the great politicians of the world meet to make decisions for the New World Order. So, when they visit there, this is where they will stay, and this is where they will deliberate. Now, in the garden, I found this statue, which they have titled David. And David is being depicted there as the good shepherd, but in his hand he has a pan flute. And David never played the pan flute, he played the lyre. The harp, at least. The harp. So, this is not David. This is the god Pan. And so I realized, when I saw the statue, this is the god Pan in his good shepherd form. Now, whenever you show the yin, you must also show the yang. So, where in the cathedral will I find his other form, his evil form, to balance him out and make, make the esoteric Kabbalistic place complete? So, I went looking for it, and I searched high and low, until I eventually found it, and I found many other things, on the relief of the building, and there it is. There he is. You see? There's the god Pan, in his evil form, as goat-footed God. So, this is the God Pan. This is the one who they worship. But Pan has a representative on this planet. And that representative also has a general. 
And that is, according to the Protestant Reformation, none other than the papacy whom they identified as Antichrist. So let's go to the Pope and see what he wears and how he displays it. Now, Pope Francis has decided that he was going to dispense with the golden cross and he kept the silver cross, to which he was accustomed, as his papal cross. And it has on it, and you can see it over there, the emblem of the Good Shepherd. Now the question is, because there are the sheep behind it, and there's you know the dove, which is pagan form of uh, the deity you know, and is not a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The question then is, is this uh, Good Shepherd representing Jesus, or is it representing the god Pan? And Pan, of course, is Satan. That's what it is. Now you will see that he has his arms crossed. Like this. Now Jesus is never depicted with his arms crossed like this, but the God of Cyrus is always depicted with his arms crossed. And as we have seen, the cross is a symbol of victory and a new order which will be brought in by the coming Messiah, which is of course the worship of Lucifer, which precedes the coming of Christ. So this God here, by the very nature, is the God Pan. But uh, am I now on speculative ground? So let's go to his predecessor and retired current Pope, who happens to be Pope Benedict. And there he is. And this is his uh, coronation and he's receiving a mitre, and on his mitre there is a deity displayed. Now I've tried to increase the size, but the quality is not very good. Of course he has the broken cross there with him, symbol of the broken cross, the bent cross, symbol of victory over Christ, of Lucifer with an emaciated Jesus hanging there. But this deity over here, is playing an instrument, and if you look very carefully, you might recognize that it is the pan flute. So he has the god Pan right on his head. He's the representative of Satan on this planet. That is what the symbolism says. Whether we like it or not, that might sound incredibly harsh, and I apologize for saying it as bluntly. Now let's go back to another movie which is used as an acronym. They can take snippets of history and turn it around to allegorize their existence. Robin Hood and Little John, the famous Sherwood Forest couple, and the, mer the merry robbers who took from the rich and gave to the poor. Now who is more concerned about the poor today than anyone else on this planet? Isn't it the Pope? He's constantly saying we must take from the rich and give to the poor. He's the ultimate Robin Hood on this planet. Now, in this story, uh, it's even in the form of a statue in England. They've glorified the story. Now, it has an ancient origin, but it has been allegorized by them to meet their needs. Now, in the animated Walt Disney one, this is uh, John. Again, you have a John who is the sophisticated one, the clever one, the one who wields the sword. Now in the previous John that we had, Peter Pan and Mary and John, he can also be an acronym, the one who wields the sword, will it be the white pope or the black pope? It'll be the black pope, right? Now let's go to this story. Here we have little, jo little John, and there you have Robin Hood in an animated form. But I want to show you the hat that they're wearing. And I want to remind you of Peter Pan that also has the hat with a feather. So it's the same symbolism that they are using. Now in the story, uh, Robin Hood has his band of merry men in the forest and he's fighting against the evil lords that control England. Now, England, of course, always was a renegade papal state and had to be constantly subdued. 
So the evil ones are the ones who run England, and the good ones are the ones who will take care of the needs of the poor, which the others never did. So again, good becomes what? Evil, and evil becomes good. Now in the story, one day he meets little John, and he says, what are you doing here? And they start fighting, and they battle on a log. Eventually, little John actually wins the battle and smacks Robin Hood so that he falls into the water. And they all laugh and make friends and he takes him into his band. And Robin Hood actually tells him that you are greater and stronger and better in battle than me. You lead the people. But little John declines and says, no, 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 you lead the people. But when uh, Robin Hood gets captured, the one who takes over the leadership is Little John. So in the acronym, who is who? This will be the, the leader, the front leader, and this will be the power behind the front leader. So this becomes the papacy, and this becomes the black papacy. So it's the white pope and the black pope. And... Let's see how this unfolds. Now his name is John. Whose name is John? All of them are John, right? All of them are John. John is an acronym. Now the John that they're actually referring to is mostly John the Baptist. And we'll see why in a moment. News, UK, Jihadi John. Extremists not radicalized by MI5. So there are rumors that MI5 actually radicalized the people that they're fighting now. Well, if you go back into history, it's very fascinating that all the so-called enemies were trained and uh, received not only their training, but their weapons from the very ones who became their super enemies in the end. The Mossad trained uh, many of the jihadists and uh, the terrorist groups that, that plague the world today, Al-Qaeda and all of these. So these are all groups that have been set up. Now, this mass murderer or this brutal murderer who always wears in black has got the acronym Jihadi John. Okay, but that's not his real name. His real name is Muhammad Mwazi, which has nothing to do with John. And then, all over the news, they plastered the image of Jihadi John beheading uh, his victims, in this case, Foley. Now, question. Is this real? Or is, the, what, is this what they want you to believe? Now, all you have to do is go to the web pages and have a look at people who are in the know, in the techno world, and there are literally hordes of web pages which will tell you that this is probably one of the worst Hollywood stunt productions that you can imagine with analysis and all of this. I don't want to get into too much of a detail, but there are hundreds of skeptics out there who say, this never happened, this is not real. So I wanted to know the various actors, who are they and what happened. Now, according to USA Today, James Foley was educated at the Catholic Jesuit College in Milwaukee. So this is Jesuit involvement again. And if you start reading about the jihadists, you will see Jesuits involved. Jesuits priests disappearing, not reappearing. Jesuits everywhere along the line. Is it possible that they are actually the masterminds training? How does the master strategist work behind the scenes? Doesn't he create the enemies? Doesn't he pull the strings behind the scenes? Doesn't he achieve his objective through Hegelian dialectic? Doesn't he create the enemy which unites humanity? These are questions which I wish to raise. Now, all of these, of course, if they are trained in Jesuit colleges, are also trained in theatrics. And if we have a look at just uh, the political scene and, and the great leaders of the world, John Paul II, wasn't he a known actor? His counterpart on the other side of the waters was Ronald Reagan. Wasn't he a known actor? Yes, the governor of uh, California 
Arnold Schwarzenegger. Is he not a trained actor? So there's a lot of theatrics involved. And whether this ever happened or whether it didn't happen, the world has to be shocked by the beheading. Beheading is probably one of the worst things. Now, if I go to Wikipedia, Jihadi John is also called John the Beetle. Now, the Beetle, John, John Lennon, was a known Luciferian. And he was controlled by the Jesuits directly. The Beetle group was controlled by the Jesuits. And he said, I sold my soul to Satan. And he's also called Jailer John. Now, now John is appearing just a little bit too frequently for my liking. And there are pseudonyms associated with a member of Islamic State of Iraq, ISIL, ISIS, and uh, they behead various people. All right, so you have all of these acronyms. Now, let's just go a little bit further into this. The Jesuits, Ebola and beheadings, trying to get the new world order going. Now, I'm not interested in the quality of this web page. Whether it's a good web page or a bad web page is irrelevant at this point, because people will take it anywhere. But what is true, that black magic Freemasonry has the symbol for the degrees 9 to 11, which depict a decapitated head by a short sword. Let me tell you a little secret. Why would they use the symbol of a beheaded individual? And why is the name John always associated with these organizations? Because John the Baptist is the mega saint of many of the esoteric occult movements. And I'll give you some details as to this. Here is the UK column. So, for instance, June the 24th, John the Baptist's Day, was appointed a Masonic holiday on which the members were to assemble, perform certain, certain rites, and partake of a common meal. Jews and Freemasons in Europe, etc., etc., at Harvard Press, etc. So, now we're getting into the nitty-gritty of the matter. The Bunch of Grapes Tavern, mentioned in the Poe chapter, was called the St. John's Lodge No. 1. Satanist Alistair Crowley, a 33 degree Freemason who influenced the Beatles tremendously, by the way, sometimes used the Elias John St. John. So when you attach an Elias like John, then it is a signal that there is an occult connection. But none of the usage has anything to do with piety. Alistair Crowley was one of the most evil men on the planet with the most evil rituals that you can imagine which should never be spoken of in good places. So in actuality it is a vicious mockery. What is memorialized is the manner of St. John's death. It is a constant source of celebration and a constant reminder to anti-Masons of what can happen to them but even deeper, because now they're just thinking on a Masonic level, let's go one deeper on a Jesuitical level. It is a constant reminder of the victory of Satan over Jesus Christ. We saw it in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, where they reverse the issues. So when they behead John the Baptist, it is a symbol of the victory of Lucifer against the followers of Jesus Christ. They're celebrating the beheading. They're not celebrating the saint. Are you with me? Okay. <clears throat> now, how did Paul die? In the same way. Now, if we go through the names of the popes, there are 23 popes with the name John. 23 with the name John. What are they standing for? Are they standing for John the Baptist or the other John? They don't tell you which one, but it's John the Baptist. And there are six popes with the name Paul. And there are two popes with the name John Paul. That's a double whammy. 
putting both into that name frame. What are they standing for and whose side are they on? I know I'm on dangerous ground, but I'm sticking my neck out. Let's go further. Joseph Ignatia Guillotin was the physician. Dr. Joseph Guillotin was a French physician who proposed on 10 October 1789 the use of a device to carry out the death penalties in France, the guillotine. But what is not known is that he was also a Jesuit. So who is the ultimate beheader on this planet? Jihadi John or the Jesuit order? And what they did in the French Revolution to bring in their new system of government which we've talked about in the past in Revelation chapter 11, this beast that rises from the bottomless pit with this godless philosophy will be controlled by people who celebrate victory over Christ by beheading. So to go and be all sanctimonious now and say how evil it is that these people out there are doing this and forgetting the history of where it comes from is sanctimonious to the highest degree. Not that I am propagating beheading anyone. This is the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. It is the largest cathedral, arguably, in the world. It is the Episcopal Cathedral which is, of course, totally controlled by occultism and Freemasonry, as everybody who has just done the slightest bit of research will find. Now, the very name is a blasphemy, because St. John was never divine. Only Satan said that man can become divine. Now, this cathedral of St. John the Divine, officially the Catholic Cathedral Church of St. John, the great divine in the city of Diocese of New York. They don't really tell you whether it's John the Baptist or whether it's John the other one. Enough that the acronym is John. Inside, for a while, they hung up the statue of the female Christ, which is a blasphemy in itself. And it was sculpted by the granddaughter of Sir Winston Churchill, whose Masonic apron can be seen right there in the British Lodge if you want to go there. This is masonry. This is masonry. And uh, in this cathedral, they also have the blessing of the beasts, where all the animals, cows and goats and bears and all kinds of creatures, horses are brought in. They poo all over the place and then all these animals are blessed. Interesting. So, a female Christ. And here's an interesting... Uh, web page, Sinister Sites, and it tells you the destruction of New York City, including the Twin Towers, sculpted right on the building, because this cathedral is a work in progress. Everything is changed a little bit every year, something is added. Just like the Jesuits have a work in progress. And there's the pillar showing the destruction of New York City with the twin sitters and the smoke going up behind it. Just as you saw in The Simpsons, just as you saw in Michael Jackson's uh, release. Is there something going on here behind the scenes? But not only that, they also have the Temple of Understanding in this cathedral, which is the United Nations organization which is there to bring about a one world religion, which we saw in the previous lecture has already been accomplished by the signing of the unity of religious agreement. So we are heading towards a mindset that all religions need to come together. Who's the enemy? Who's the enemy? The enemy is the extremist. And the extremist is going to kill us. And the extremist is going to cut our head off. And he's coming to bomb me right here. And he's going to put a smart bomb in this place. And he's going to blow us to smithereens, etc. Fear is the mechanism of herding people into a camp. Now, I'm not interested, let me make this plain, of whether my allegories are right or whether they are wrong. Whether they are spot on or whether they are off track. It's not relevant. The question is, where is it leading to? Because they say the ends justifies the means. If the end result 
is in accordance with what the Bible tells us is going to happen, then I know who's behind it, irrespective of whether I'm right or wrong. That's the point. So let's have a look and see where it's heading. Former British Foreign Secretary Robin Cook, a very fit man, very active, just suddenly dropped dead on his morning walk. But leave it at that. He said, the truth is, this is now, so he's standing in front of number 10 Downing Street, high politician, high uh, position in the establishment. He just got fed up and he said, the truth is there is no Islamic army or terrorist group called Al-Qaeda, and any informed intelligence officer knows this. He said, but there is a propaganda campaign to make the public believe in the presence of an identified entity representing the devil, only in order to drive the TV watcher to accept the unified international leadership for a war against terrorism. The country behind this propaganda is the United States. So he said. And then he died. So there is no Al-Qaeda. Now, any informed person will tell you that Al-Qaeda was created, funded by the powers of B in the United States and elsewhere in the world, united, trained by the very organizations which became their super enemies in the end. It's a front organization. It doesn't exist. What does he say? It doesn't exist. If it has outlived its usefulness, you replace it with another one that doesn't exist. Even though it has a name, ISIS, and even though it is prominent, and even though it apparently chops heads off of trained Jesuits. I don't believe a word of it, personally. There's an agenda, and I have a Bible that tells me what the agenda is, and I need to focus on what does the Bible tell me the agenda is? The agenda is the destruction of Christ and his followers. That's the agenda. There's no other agenda. My enemy is not over there. My enemy is right here. Jean-Louis Secundo, a Jesuit, born in Uruguay and residing in Canada, wrote Theology and the Church in 1985, which carries the subtitle, A Response to Cardinal Ratzinger and a Warning to the Church. Here's a Jesuit publicly telling the Pope to get lost. Now, of course, we know that the two are in cahoots, and we know that the one is the general, and he can listen to a command, or he can disregard a command, etc., and that there is a tunnel between them and that they chat on a regular basis as to how to plan the Hegelian dialectic. Now, this is what he writes, and I want you to note, listen carefully to what he says. This is a Jesuit writing. As such, the book is a defense of every Jesuit priest that shoulders a carbine. Now, notice what the Jesuits do. Shoulders a carbine, joins the jungle guerrillas. It makes clear why Jesuits can be ministers with with portfolio in Marxist governments, why Jesuits can attack John Paul on his teaching on sexual morality. So the Pope says, the white Pope says, contraceptives are evil, we mustn't do this, we must have decent relationships, and the other ones will say, hand out condoms, hand out free this, free sex, free that. Hegelian dialectic, we'll see how it works in a moment. Why Jesuits spend their days and their lives solving union problems. Who's behind the unions? One of the means to bring about a time of trouble such as never was. Jesuits. Organizing sugarcane workers, running factories, constructing low-cost housing, help Planned Parenthood Federation of America spread the use of contraceptives, run nationwide hospitals, dispensary networks, organize political demonstrations, for this and against that, according to the issues of the day, are presented by the teaching authority of the People's Church. 
These are the actions of the new faith, true to the new theology according to which the material needs of men must be the prior object of the church's effort. Not the spreading of the gospel. Who cares about the spreading of the gospel? Let's tread on him. Let's crush him. So, according to this Jesuit, in which lines of work are the Jesuits involved? Every single thing. Every single thing. And if we think they don't exist, it's because they don't want us to believe that they exist. They are everywhere. So, the Pope says, that Francis said, Oh, I lament this new legislation that came out in the United States of America. We have to talk about morality. And what are these foot soldiers? What do they do? Here is Cardinal Dolan. He's the new man on the block as the head chief knight of Malta in the United States. He take, took over from Cardinal Egan, who died. And there he is. And uh, here he says that the cardinal was the most wonderful thing under the sun. And his first official job, here he is, marching through the streets of New York, parade at the first ever gay activist group. So, you think the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. They know exactly what they're doing. This is Hegelian dialectic. But what is interesting, there was a backlash. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, uh, Grand Marshal, despite backlash from the faithful Catholics, unhappy with the organizer's decision to allow an open homosexual activist group to march the event. But Dolan said, I'm as radiant as the sun. So thanks be to God for the honor and the joy, said Carly and Dolan on Tuesday morning. Isn't that interesting? Thanks be to God for the honor and the joy. Catholic commentator Michael Morris and his team present at the parade were able to question Dolan on his decision during the press scrum. Your Eminence, do you have anything to say to the loyal Catholics who find what you're doing here a great scandal to the faith? No, come on in. We'd love to have you, Dolan replied. The controversial decision prompted the Catholic League and at least one Catholic school to pull out of the parade. While nearly 5,000 people signed a petition urging, urging Cardinal Dolan to withdraw from the event. He wouldn't. The Cardinal refused to back down. He said, I have no problem with the decision at all. I think the decision is a wise one, etc., etc., etc. So, the Catholic Church is well suited to absorb into its ranks those who wish to die in their sins, as well as those who wish to be saved by their works. Anyone is welcome, depending on which camp you want to stand. Now, let's see where the war on terror and dialectic thinking leads us. I just showed you that to show how they manipulate minds. Je suis Charlie. Of course, the Simpsons took it up. It was a major terrorist attack. The world is afraid of the jihadists. The world is afraid of jihadi John. He's coming with his knife. So let's kill a few people here and let's kill a few people there. Didn't the general say we can sacrifice our own as well so that eventually we can achieve our objective? So the Simpsons have sympathy with Jesse Swat Charlie. Muslims again call to outlaw law defamation of religion with exceptions. We don't want defamation of religion. They tried to get this act through the United Nations. It was rejected where they say you're not allowed to say anything against any other religion. We want this law. Now when the church asks it, they say church and state is separate, we're not going to do it, so let's get the jihadists to ask for it. Let's get them to ask for it. Let's ask a front organization to ask for it. And uh, the German uh, parliamentarian, Schäuble, said, gezielte Tötung. We should be able to permit targeted death penalty. Do you know the death penalty has been removed in the world? But the Bible says, what does the Bible say? When the mark of the beast is promulgated, what are they going to say? You won't be able to buy and sell and eventually there'll be a death decree. Oh, how can this happen? Here the parliamentarians are already saying, if it's a terrorist, and we just have to redefine that word, terrorist, 
Take him out. Take him out. Isn't it interesting how these terrorists manage to escape all the time? Nobody ever catches them. Nobody ever knows where they are. But the press has r regular discussions with them, as well as Jesuit priests. Read the press. Read the press. Nobody knows where they are. The mighty CIA can't catch them. And ISIS, well, they're the greatest enemy the world has ever seen. The United States says, no, we're not putting boots on the ground. If the Iraqi army can't do it, well, they'll have to learn through their pain. We're not going to do it. Then the other television says, excuse me, how do, how do the weapons end up in ISIS's hand? Oh, they've confiscated it. They've confiscated the tank, yes. Where they get all the anti-aircraft from? Did they go to Safeway supermarket and go and buy some of those things? Who supplies weapons like that? How do they get those weapons? Ask yourself some questions here. If this is the greatest enemy the world has ever faced, why not confront it? No, no, no. Send a pathetic army that you want to lose in the first place anyway. Send them to do it, so you hit two birds with one stone. This is strategy of the most brilliant kind. So, the White House resists calls to focus on Islamist terrorism at three-day extremism uh, conference. No, no, no. We cannot say the problem is only the Islamists. The problem is extremism. Uh, but who's chopping off the heads? Oh, well, excuse me, who's apparently chopping off the heads? It's, it's Jihadi John, it's, it's ISIS, we've got to be afraid of ISIS. Are we going to condemn them? No, we're only condemning extremism. This is fascinating stuff. The International Conference, which begins Tuesday in Washington, will seek ways of deterring homegrown terrorism, has been criticized by Republicans for failing to single out Islamist extremism for particular scrutiny. I mean, look at the terrorist attacks. How many heads do you want to lose? How many people do you want to see dead? They're the problem. No, they're not the problem. I wonder who the real problem is. Let's see. Pope Francis, Paris attacks the result of deviant form of religion. And uh, Pope Francis called on religious communities to condemn terrorism, especially Muslim leaders. He said, I express my hope that religious, political, and intellectual leaders, especially those of the Muslim co community, will condemn all fundamentalist and extremist interpretation of religion, with which attempts to justify such acts of violence. So yes, he mentions them, but he doesn't exclude others. And then he goes further. Vatican Radio, Pope Francis, religion should not be confined to personal conscience. Excuse me. Here he has a discussion with uh, the Italian president, uh, Sergio Mattarella, and he says, the orderly development of a civil pluralistic society requires that the authentic spirit of religion not be confined to personal conscience. Uh, is this in harmony with the Bible, yes or no? No, no, but that its significant role in the construction of society is recognized, said Pope Francis, his remarks to the Italian president. Though independent, the church and state share the common responsibility. What kind of legislation do they want? They want the church and the state together to regulate conscience. Are we waiting for something like that? Isn't this a prophetic scenario in Revelation chapter 13? Okay, Ban Ki-moon, proposed meeting of religious leaders at the UN. Radio Vatican again. UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon announced during the meeting against extremism, violent held in Washington this week, etc., etc. The meeting brought together representatives of 60 countries and the Pope is going to speak at the United Nations. There's a major crisis in the world. We have to sort out this problem. In his speech, he warned of the apogee of a new generation of transnational terrorist groups, a strategy of these extremists. You hear this more and more. And Pope Francis? Pope condemns religious fundamentalism and Middle East violence. 
Pope Francis strongly condemned violence in the Middle East Friday on in an interview with the Vatican. Correspondent, Barcelona-based daily, whatever. He says, quote, A fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. Now it gets fascinating. The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. All right, so who does that include? What's the definition of fundamentalism again? Protestant form of thinking that takes the Bible literally. Do they know who the problem child is? Who could be part of this fundamentalist group that doesn't strike anyone and doesn't kill anyone, but by their philosophy is classified as violent? I'm interested. Please tell me. Well, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't have a problem with it. It says, people who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. And Mary Online in 2003, the editor said, the challenge regarding the Sabbath Sunday question by Rome of 100 years ago remains, either the Catholic Church is right, or the Seventh-day Adventists are right, there can be no other choice, and if one chooses neither, then the whole doctrine of sola scriptura collapses, and with it the pillars upon which all of Protestantism stand. So there's only two choices here. Rome saying this, not me. Now let's go to Catholic answers, and ask them whether they understand the issue. They say Seventh-day Adventism cannot change its views on the Catholic Church, being the whore of Babylon, without admitting that it was wrong on the Sunday worship. It cannot admit that Sunday worship is not the mark of the beast without changing its views on the Jewish Sabbath. The Seventh-day Adventism cannot cease to be anti-Catholic without ceasing to be Seventh-day Adventism. Have they identified an enemy, yes or no? Now, my next question would be, will they start indoctrinating minds against Seventh-day Adventism? And if they start doing that and starting to indoctrinate minds, because the ultimate enemy is not jihadist, the ultimate enemy is not ISIS, the ultimate enemy is those who follow Christ and keep his commandments. That is what Revelation chapter 13 says. Everything else is manipulation to receive the mindset. Now, what's the best medium to create the mindset? Television? Is that a good medium? Okay. Family Guy. One of the cartoons, probably one of the most disgusting cartoons out there. It's in the same category as The Simpsons. Also written by these brilliant, Gnostic, intelligent, phd individuals who have the most vile way of dealing with religious matters. They have little statues and relics and things that they sell of God and of the characters. And uh, what they do with God is so disgusting, you cannot believe it. God creates Adam and Eve, and then he peeks at them when they are naked with a pile of pornography behind him. He's a pervert. God, in, in their series, picks up uh, drunks and spends his time in the bar and picking up prostitutes. God doesn't create the world with the breath of his mouth. He creates it with his other end. It's disgusting what these people do. You can see they hate God. They hate everything about God. But millions of people watch this. Now let's see what they are saying. Here is the family. This is a normal family. Can you see they're normal? But these two nerds over here are anything but normal, these prim and proper little nerds. And uh, deducing from what they say, I assume that in this story, these are probably Christian scientists because they say that they have um, 
a female as a prophet. And they have discussions with them, but they're not getting anywhere because these people are not normal. This is normal, you know, you eat, you have uh, the right look about just being normal, you have your dog and your kid, these are nerds. And after the discussion, they say, with these people you can do nothing. These people have a mindset that you cannot change. Let's get out of here. We can never harmonize with them. Now remember that the Jesuits said, this world is created for what? For sinners. And the legislation must cover sinners. Because those who are righteous are few, and those that they are, you can't live with them. Now, what's the final target? Let's have a look. This is, I found this fascinating. Let's listen to it. I think we're wasting our time here. They're obviously very committed to their beliefs. But their beliefs are crazy, Brian. I don't know who's crazier. These people are those Seventh-day Adventists. I'm a Methodist. We believe that the Lord is our Savior, and we remember Him by going to church and praising Him every Sunday. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. We believe all the same things that you believe, but we go to church on Saturdays. What? <laughs> Did you get that? What is being implanted in young minds and adults, because this is an adult sitcom that people watch and the kids watch it too. Who are the crazy ones? The sectarians. Now who's the craziest of them all according to this? The Seventh-day Adventists. They're craziest. Are minds being prepared for something to come? I'm just asking the question. How often we are told to soften the message of warning, to only live an example, necessary as it is, this is me, my thinking, but not to expose the evils of the man of sin and those in confederacy with him. We have people who are so duped into believing that these organizations out there are, are good people with good intentions, and that Jesuits, ooh, they don't really exist. You know, they might have existed in the Middle Ages, are we so blind that we do not understand prophecy anymore? Who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? My Bible tells me it's the man of sin who sits in the temple of God pretending to be God. And he's using the beast out of the earth to do his service for him because he controls him. Called to expose the man of sin. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear, has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin, who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power, who has thought to change times and laws, and to oppress the people of God, who stand firmly and honor him by keeping the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation, as holy unto the Lord. Let me tell you something, that is the enemy. Now if you look at the poor Muslim, my heart goes out to the Muslim. Imagine being used and manipulated and kept in poverty and hoarded and chased and your housing destroyed around you to achieve an objective and you're, being, you're just a tool in the hands of these individuals. I'm sure God's heart is crying out to the poor Muslim who is trapped in this situation and doesn't even know what's hitting him and where it's coming from. He doesn't understand it either. Instead of, of having the mindset instilled into our minds, that is the enemy. No, the enemy is not there. The enemy is in Rome. The enemy is manipulating the world and creating mindsets. And our duty is to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. That's the message for the time and nothing else. So may the Lord help us to spread a message that will not only reach the ears of deceived Protestants, not only reach the ears of deceived, marginalized, destroyed Muslims, but to reach the ears of this whole planet, every single one. We cannot now choose an enemy here and choose an enemy there when God has already revealed in his word and through the spirit of prophecy, who the enemy is. May God give us wisdom to deal with this issue. And where it is leading is part of the next episode. And what the final events are when everything is in place. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, there is so much deception out there in the world. And they control the press, they control the media, they control the internet. We have but a short time to bring this message to the forefront, to preach to people where the enemy is and what the decision is. The decision is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Who is in control? Is it the God of the universe or is it the God of this world? Help us to make right decisions and help us to focus on that which is relevant for our time and to cry loud and to spare not so that many may yet be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.